Typically, temperatures are measured in either degrees Celsius, degrees Fahrenheit, or Kelvin. The first two of these are useful because more reasonable numbers correspond to temperatures we experience every day. Kelvin, on the other hand, is used almost exclusively in scientific contexts because it's on an absolute scale. This means that all temperatures when measured in Kelvin are positive, whereas in Celsius and Fahrenheit, temperatures frequently drop below zero. For this reason, zero Kelvin is known as absolute zero. It's the coldest that anything can possibly get. But why does the scale just stop at zero? Well, usually the temperature of a system is given by the average kinetic energy of any one particle in the system, up to some constants. Absolute zero is simply when no particles have any kinetic energy. Everything is completely frozen in place, unable to move. Now, due to quantum effects, it turns out that it's actually physically impossible to truly reach absolute zero, but we can get close. However, what if I told you that not only can you achieve negative absolute temperatures, but it's actually relatively easy to do? This may seem to contradict everything I just talked about, but that really only applies to systems made up of atoms and molecules that we more or less treat like billiard balls. Since thermodynamics is really just the study of systems with a huge number of elements, we shouldn't be restricted to just these billiard ball systems. Other systems that we might consider are the electrons in a large number of atoms in a lattice, or a bunch of stationary magnetic dipoles in a magnetic field. In both of these, it doesn't make much sense to talk about their kinetic energy. So if we want to use thermodynamics, we need to generalize our notion of temperature to also include these systems. Our first guess might be to use the average total energy rather than the average kinetic energy but it's pretty easy to see why this doesn't work by thinking about what happens to an insulated box of gas when we move it from the floor onto a table. Since it's now higher off the ground, it gains a bit more gravitational potential energy. If temperature is based off of total energy, then the temperature should rise, but we know this doesn't happen. However, since these new systems don't necessarily have kinetic energy, the total energy should still play a role. But we have to be a bit careful since, in thermodynamic contexts, potential energies have a tendency to diverge. For example, if we have an infinite number of magnetic dipoles in a magnetic field, all of which are aligned with the field, the potential energy of the system is going to be negative infinity, since each dipole has a finite negative potential energy. Other forms of potential energy, like gravitational, require some reference point for them to make sense. In either case, it makes much more sense to talk about changes in potential energy rather than the quantity itself. Since we want to incorporate the total energy, including potential, into our definition of temperature, we then have to only consider changes in the total energy. What other values do we have to play with? Well, one value that we know is very important to all thermodynamic systems is the system's entropy. Outside of information theory, though, it tends to be a lot more useful to talk about how entropy changes rather than entropy as a quantity itself. So, similar to energy, we will only consider changes in entropy. Okay, so we want to try to find a relationship between temperature, the change in entropy, and the change in average total energy. The easiest thing to consider is how entropy changes if we change the energy by a small amount at different temperatures. To do this, let's just consider a single particle of a classical gas. As I've talked about in my previous videos, entropy is best thought of in terms of information, specifically information we don't know. In the case of the single particle, the information comes in the form of its position and its momentum. Let's say we start with complete knowledge of the system, or in other words, we know the particle's exact position and momentum, and it starts in a zero entropy state. Let's first think of the high temperature case where the initial momentum is very large. Now, we can add some small amount of kinetic energy to the particle and see how the entropy changes. Well, when the kinetic energy is increased, we add a bit of momentum to the particle but it could be in any direction that increases the magnitude of the momentum. 
Since we don't know the exact direction of the new momentum vector, our ignorance of the system has increased and therefore so has the entropy. However, since the initial momentum vector was huge and we have only varied it by a small amount, we know that the momentum vector has to be very similar to that that we had before. In fact, when the temperature goes to infinity, the entropy wouldn't change at all. So at high temperatures, the change in entropy with respect to a small change in energy is going to be small. On the other hand, at low temperatures, the initial momentum vector is tiny. Here, a small change in energy can have a very big impact on the new direction of the momentum. In the case that the particle isn't moving initially, this actually leads to complete uncertainty in the direction of the momentum. So at low temperatures, the change in entropy is large when the energy is changed by a small amount. From this little thought experiment, we can see that the change in entropy is inversely related to the temperature. This leads to the expression for temperature that 1 over the temperature is equal to the change in entropy over the change in energy. In other words, the inverse of the temperature is given by the slope of an energy versus entropy plot. From this expression, the idea of negative temperature doesn't seem so crazy. It just means that the system will increase its entropy by giving up energy. Let's look at an example where this happens. Say we have a large number n of particles which can exist in one of two states a ground state with zero energy, and an excited state with energy epsilon. Now, we give the system m units of epsilon, so that the total energy is given by E equals m epsilon. To find the entropy, all we have to do is find the multiplicity, or the number of different ways of distributing these m units of energy among the n particles. This is just given by the binomial coefficient n choose m, or n choose e over epsilon. Now, we just take the logarithm of this multiplicity to give the entropy, and take a derivative to get the inverse temperature. Finally, let's look at the plots of entropy and temperature side by side. As we might expect, when there's not a lot of energy in the system, the entropy is very low, and so is the temperature. We can also see that just by lowering the energy of the system, we will never get below absolute zero, since the system can't have less than zero energy. The entropy of the system is maximized when we have the same number of particles in an excited state as in the ground state. In other words, there are the largest number of available microstates when a system of n particles has n over 2 units of energy. Looking at the plot of temperature, this corresponds to a formally infinite temperature. All this is saying is that if we allow the system to freely give or take as much energy as it wants, it will tend to end up with n over 2 units of energy in it. Now, the interesting part is where there are more particles in the excited state than in the ground state. This phenomenon is known as a population inversion, and this is when the temperature is negative. With this, it becomes clear that there's nothing mystical about negative temperatures. All it means is that the system will lose energy when freely allowed to exchange as much energy as it wants with an external source. Another way to think about it is that if the system wants to maximize entropy, as the second law of thermodynamics tells us it will, at positive temperatures it has to pull in energy to do so, but at negative temperatures it has to lose energy. One great example of a useful application of negative temperature is in lasers. If an electron is in an excited state in an atom, and a photon comes by with the exact energy as that between the ground state and this excited state, it can actually force the electron to decay to the ground state and emit a second photon. This is called stimulated emission. So, if we are able to pump a bunch of electrons into a long-lived excited state with, say, an electrical current, when one decays it will emit a photon of exactly the energy needed to force another electron to decay. So one photon becomes two, and two becomes four, and four becomes eight, and so on. But for this cascade to happen, we need almost all of the electrons to be in an excited state. We need a population inversion. So, next time you're shining a laser pointer for a cat to chase around, 
Take a moment to appreciate the fact that you're holding something in your hand that on some level is operating below absolute zero.